morning again. Thank you, singing team. That was lovely. And, and thank you. I, I really uh, enjoy that uh, musical presentation. And I notice our new Mrs. Liu was, was up there singing. That's, that's great. Not used to that, that title yet, are you? Huh? Where's your husband, by the way? Okay. All right. Now, it goes without saying that this has been um, a challenging week for, uh, for all of us, for our city, for our, for our people. Uh, I'm a college teacher, you, you can imagine uh, what, what I went through. And as I sat down and I, I touched up the, the sermon for this week, I, I had to ask myself, what's this got to do with, what's this got to do with what we're facing? And uh, I, the message I, I, I got from, from my heart, from the Spirit, is that if we only speak on the immediate, right, it might seem very present, but it's only good for yesterday. It's only good for yesterday, and yesterday's gone forever. If we speak on the more eternal, it might seem very remote but it's good for tomorrow and the day after and the day after. And therein lies the challenge. How, how do we make these more eternal messages on the one hand, on the one hand, true, and at the same time, uh, applicable right, and, and meaningful for today and tomorrow. Right? Forget about yesterday. Yesterday is gone. I mean, nothing, right. So on that note, uh, let's get into uh, Hebrews. Last time we began a new topical series and, uh, and saw from Hebrews 1 that creation highlight Christ's power, worthiness of worship, and, etern uh, and eternal. And yet, as amazing as, as creation is, it is in fact perishing. Jesus will renew creation one day. And in between the first creation and the coming renewal, we have this life which sadly is tainted by sin. Thankfully, the same Christ who made the universe also dealt with our sin, and he has dealt with it completely. As such, we can face our everyday challenges with a different attitude. Difficulties are real, but we need not be tired, bitter, or frustrated. We can be peaceful knowing that Jesus has completely dealt with them. And along with our attitude change, we're in fact being prepared for the renewal of creation. This life is in Christ is that process, which although is full of unknowns, has a guaranteed outcome, eternity with Christ. So today, we move on to the next topic, which is priesthood. Now, in, pre in Hebrews, priesthood is covered in three main passages. Chapter 2, verses 10 to 18. Chapter 4, verses 15 to 16, and chapter 9, 11, all the way to chapter 10, verse 19. We will only look at 2, 10 to 18 today, but as we get into the main ideas of this passage, we will also reference the other two sections. Before we do that, let's have a quick recap of the context. Hebrews was written for Jewish Christians in the Roman Empire. All right, so the recipients, they knew Jewish customs, including the role of the priest. All right. The Jewish priests were originally ordained for Aaron's descendants. After the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, it ceased symbolically because there was no place for the priest to present sacrifices. Now, the timing makes interpreting Hebrews a little tricky because we cannot date for certain whether it was written before or after the destruction of the temple. If it was before, the Jewish aspects would weigh in, but if it was after, then less so. And it was written just around that borderline, so we can't tell for sure. And as is often the case, 
I don't have a definitive answer on such technicalities, so I will try to cover both sides without getting too academic. In short, I will try to present the Jewish priesthood as relevant to our faith before demonstrating how Christ's priesthood is relevant to us. The Jewish priesthood is relevant to our faith, and Christ's priesthood is relevant to us. So on that note, let's start with the text, chapter 2, verse 10. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. The first point about priesthood is that the priest suffers. And if we don't consider this carefully, we might agree with the text sooner than we should without considering the full implications. Just exactly how did Jesus suffer and why? The short textbook answer would be that he suffered through death on the cross to die for our sins. All that is true, of course, but those are references to Jesus, the Lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice, not the priest. Here, we are looking at Jesus, the priest. So if you want a clear distinction, let's say, how did Jesus suffer other than the cross? How did Jesus suffer other than the cross, and why? Now, I don't mean the beating and the insults prior to the cross. I mean, how did Jesus suffer outside of the Passion Week? Did he suffer? Now, if we look at the Gospels, and it doesn't matter which one, we would in fact struggle to find episodes that depict Jesus in suffering outside of the Passion Week, outside of the week in Jerusalem. He has never been sick, and we should all know that being tired or thirsty doesn't really count as suffering. As far as he, we can tell, he was hungry just once after 40 days of fasting in the wilderness. Otherwise, he was well fed. So how did Jesus suffer? And what difference does it make? Let's take a look at verses 11 to 13. Both the ones who make people holy and those who are made holier are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I, the children God has given me. Here we see Jesus suffered while bringing God's people in so that he could complete his mission perfectly. In other words, Jesus suffered for his faithfulness. Simpler still, Jesus suffered because he chose to suffer, and he chose to suffer even before the cross for our benefits. So if we were to add the priesthood, the mission, and the suffering together, we would see that Jesus' priestly mission was a mission of suffering. Again, I stress, suffering not just on the cross, but more so before it, for our benefits. So that begs the question. We know the cross brought about our salvation, which indeed is an immeasurable benefit. But how do we benefit from Christ's other sufferings? And what does that mean for all of us today? To grasp that, we need to remind ourselves what a priest does. The original readers, being Jewish, knew that well. And chapter 5 would remind us that a priest role, the Jewish priest role, was to represent the people before God. So Jesus represents us before God. All well and good, right? All well and good. Jesus represents us before God. But where is the suffering. And this is where the important description comes in. Sometimes we use words like God or people without descriptions, which is fine if we are mindful, but we are not always mindful, so God and people becomes bland or meaningless names. 
the descriptions in verses 10 to 13 are very important. What is God's description? Holy. What's people's description? Sinful. So a priest's role, which is what chapter 5 and 7 went on, go on to expound, is that Jesus chooses to represent sinful people before the holy God. And for that, he suffers. Jesus chooses to represent holy people, sorry, sinful people before the holy God, and for that, he suffers. So there are three main ideas here. Jesus' choice representing sinful people before the Holy God. Now, we have already looked at Jesus' choice, so let's consider representing sinful people and before the Holy God a little bit. How does a priest represent sinful people? There seems to be two requirements. One, he has to be worthy, and two, the people have to be willing. The worthy part is a little theological, and Hebrews would go into great length detailing how Jesus, being the Son of God, is the perfect high priest. Uh, you can read on if you're interested, or you can ask Dee or myself. The second part is where the work gets ugly, representing sinners. And let's not get too distracted by sinners yet. It is the representing part that's the struggle. Because sinners on their own do not want to be represented by the priest. The priest has to convince them that they need representation. And that's suffering. Now I know that's a lot of words, so let me give you an example. I confess it is a simplified example, but I hope you get the gist. Let's say that Dan is sick, but he thinks he's fine. And he wants nothing to do with the medicine that he's been given. Joe is on a business trip, so it's my job to make sure that Dan takes his medicine. Now, it's a task that many of you have experienced. Now, however, in this scenario, there's a catch. Even though I'm Dan's father, so I could overpower him by force or authority, I choose to do neither of that. Right. Rather, I have to use all the other means to explain to him that he is sick until he is convinced. And not only that, but I also have to show Jo upon her return that I have been faithful each and every time without using force or abusing my authority, yet making sure that Dan takes his medicine without fail. Which way do you think is easier? explaining to Dan or forcing him and which do you think would create more suffering I think you get the point and that's sort of how Jesus suffered for his priesthood he never forced or scared anyone into following him even though all authority in heaven and on earth is his and yet he did not abandon even one he was faithful in bringing all that God has given him to God and in doing so ever so gently and meekly Jesus suffered so if we read ahead to verse 18 one of the temptations that Jesus might be might have had is to give up on sinners and just wipe out the world by force right and if we read Deuteronomy 9 we will recall that such an idea is not new God abstains from it for other reasons, even though he most certainly has that option. Jesus chose to represent me before God, even though I don't want him, and for that he suffers. Jesus chose to represent me before God, even though I don't want him, and for that he suffers. Now, multiply this by everyone whom Jesus has or will reach out to, and we might begin to have an appreciation of the suffering. And I stress, this is apart from the cross. The cross actually turned all that suffering into glory and joy, but that's for another message. Now, having understood this, it makes the next two points of priesthood easier to understand, but arguably even harder to practice. 
Next, the priest congregates. In other words, the priest doesn't just bring people in through representing them. The priest also brings people together as they are brought in. Congregate, being brought in and being brought together are inseparable. And verses 11 to 13 makes it clear. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here I am. And the children God has given me. First, Jesus turns individuals from ones who rejected him to, un to ones who would accept him. Then, he turns them from fellow sinners into brothers and sisters. God's family. And that's congregation. So extending Jesus' faithfulness, right? we can see that Jesus is faithful in bringing in through representing them before God. And he is faithful in bringing together through congregating them before God. Faithfulness in representation, faithfulness in congregation. Now, I don't think you need me to explain what the application might be. Many of you are faithful in evangelizing, and many of you are faithful in fellowship, so praise God. Now, have you ever considered that in doing so, you are in fact living out your priesthood? Right? So rather than telling you about sharing the gospel or joining hands in fellowship, perhaps I'll just share briefly about what priesthood highlights apart from what we typically know or do. If we think, priest, think of priesthood as representation and congregation, then the gospel is all about relationship and less about knowledge or ideas. It doesn't undermine sin or the cross. Christ's suffering makes the point very clearly. At the same time, priesthood does remind us that we are introducing Jesus as someone we know to someone else who needs him. The gospel is introducing Jesus as someone we know to someone who needs him. It's all about people. So coming back to application. How are we to introduce Jesus? Specifically, how are we to introduce Jesus in such a way that our friend would benefit from our own relationship with him? Our friend should benefit from our own relationship with Jesus. And as we pursue this question, it becomes clear that our gospel is inseparable from our testimony. And as we share both, we're in fact sharing our lives. In short, as priests, we share our lives. And our lives are all about our relationship with Jesus, the High Priest. So if you were to ask me, Vincent, what did you do with Joe and Dan this week? Right. Very simple question. My answer will be full and very indicative of the intimate relationship I have with both of them. Right? If you tell me, I'll tell you. And it will be very full, very intimate. And if you were to ask me, Vincent, what did you do with Jesus this week? Could I give you an equally full and intimate answer? If someone were to ask us, Hey, what did you do with Jesus this week? Could we give them a full and intimate answers all about relationships? Priesthood reminds us that we should. And if we don't, guess what? Our high priest is waiting to make that possible. And that's the third and last point of today. Jesus' faithfulness in bringing people in and together is not just his mission is also ours. Verse 17 reads, For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, 
in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. This, of course, carries the message of the word became flesh, and then the cornerstone message on Jesus. But again, here we are looking at the priesthood. So let's put the word aside for a moment. Having been made flesh, Jesus then calls us his body. Or collectively, he calls the church the body of Christ. Why is that? It's not a deep, fascinating question. Quite the opposite. In bringing us in and bringing us together, Christ wants us to replicate him. In other words, the mission of the priest is to be Jesus to the world. Now occasionally we might come across the phrase, I am Jesus. And understood correctly, this is neither blasphemy nor arrogance, but an acceptance of the priesthood that Christ has passed on to us. So what does it mean to be Jesus? Now part of that we have already touched upon. Jesus represents and congregates, so we do the same for him. The last part on replication is a little bit more forward-looking. It means that we want those whom we represent and congregate for Christ to do the same. Then we would know that replication is going on, or if you prefer the classical language, if, we ha if those we have reached for Christ are reaching out, we know the body of Christ is growing. If those we reach for Christ is reaching out, we know the body of Christ is growing. Now the idea is not that mind-boggling. Just think about Christ, Peter, and John Mark. Or think about Christ, Paul, and Timothy. Right? And we would know what replication means. So to sum up before we close today, Christ's priesthood is one of suffering, congregation, and replication. Christ suffered for seeking to represent those who don't want him. Christ congregate by bringing people together so strangers could become brothers and sisters. And Christ replicates by giving us the same mission as his, to keep congregating and replicating even as suffering continues. It's all about people. A priest mission is a people's mission. Just to end on a more disturbing note, I want to remind us what kind of people we are talking about. Verse 15 reads, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. People who are held in slavery by their fear of death. Don't they need Jesus? And more personally still, don't they need us to be their priest? Other than Jesus, no one took on their priesthood willingly. Even Moses resisted. So we need not judge ourselves. What we need to be is mindful that is Jesus' faithfulness as high priest perfect enough so that we, in his perfection, can remain faithful? Right. So in the spirit of a priest replicating, let's not pray for ourselves over this today. Right, let's not pray for ourselves. Rather, let's pray for someone we are reaching out to. So say that I'm reaching out to Bob, then let me pray faithfully that God would use me to help Bob replicate and be faithful. As Bob bears fruit, I know that my prayer is answered and both Bob and I are being changed. So in the name of our great high priest, May all of us be Jesus. God bless.